Let's see. My first question would be, what were your parents' hopes for you and your education? High quality education. Because they were educated themselves? They were. Uh, both my parents uh, are from high education stock, I'd say. My mother graduated Syracuse, magna cum laude. Um, my father graduated Brown, cum laude. Mm. And uh, I'm the youngest of five, and education was a must in my family. Very All nice. the way through college. We really didn't have the option of not going to college. One of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my older siblings didn't have to go to college, so they didn't. But <laughs> me and my twin brother, we had to go to college. It wasn't an option. Mm -hmm. So I get that. Um, where did you grow up? Grew up in Hyde Park. Okay. Excuse me a moment. Great. You grew up grew in Hyde Park, which is, which is one of the neighborhoods of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, Boston is broken up into different neighborhoods uh, that all fall within the vicinity of the of the of the city of Boston, mm -hmm. and it's one of the it's probably the southernmost neighborhood of Boston, mm -hmm. probably the most or one of the most rural neighborhoods of Boston. Okay. And where did you go to school? I went to grammar school at the William Monroe Trotter in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. I went to middle school at the Phyllis Wheatley in Roxbury, and I went to high school at Boston Latin Academy in Boston. And what kind of system, was it a magnet system, school system you went to? Correct, correct. And uh, how did that come about? My mother was a big social advocate, uh, and part of the, she was, at the time, I think she was involved with the Boston League of Women Voters, uh, might have been president at the time in the 70s. She was the chairperson of the State Board of Education, so a lot of volunteer work around Boston. Um, and she was a huge proponent of, uh, of integration. And she didn't grow up in the city, so she didn't come with uh, the stigma of city living. And uh, so she was a, a huge proponent of what had then become Judge Garrity's mandate uh, for forced busing, for forced integration or desegregation, mm -hmm. termed differently uh, over the years. And um, so she, I don't know whether I was actually forced to go to the Trotter, but she was a, a huge advocate for it and, uh, and, let's say, volunteered me. Okay. And your siblings? I'm youngest of five. Uh, my closest sibling is three years older. And she, uh, so by the way, that is the magnet system. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I guess I'll explain that quickly. Okay. The Trotter, Wheatley, and at the time Copley High School, which is no longer uh, in existence, was, was the elementary, middle, high school magnet system that the Boston had through the, the uh, desegregation efforts. And my <clears throat> youngest, older sibling, uh, three years older than me, uh, also a Diane, two ends, but she was known as Dee Dee. Uh, went to the, I think it was the Mackey School, but I could be wrong on that, and that was Mattapan, and mm -hmm. she was bust. It was an all, uh, virtually all-black school, whereas mine was more mixed, uh, and that was for probably 6th, 7th, 8th grade before she went to Boston Latin. So um, you and her both bust at the same time? Correct. My then oldest three siblings were beyond middle school at that time, and they went to Boston Tech and Boston Latin, Boston Latin. And those are tests? Those are all exam schools. Exam Boston schools. Tech, Boston Latin, Boston Latin Academy are the they're public schools, but they're the three college preparatory exam schools within the Boston public schools. And that was the influence of your mom? Sure, both yeah. my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, that there was no other option, you know. Uh, in terms of the integration and going over there, nope, I was too young. You know, I certainly followed their guidance. And uh, um, Diane and I spoke previously, and it wasn't a transition from anything else. That's what I knew. So I was bused from kindergarten. Uh, I think she skipped 
me at kindergarten one, I went right into kindergarten two at the Trotter. So that would have been maybe five or six years old. And then through fifth grade, and then the Wheatley was six, seven, eight. And then on to high school from there, and out of the magnet system from there. Many of my friends at the Wheatley went on to the Copley, which mm -hmm. was an extension of the magnet program. Um, do you think if you went with your friends to the Copley, you would have got as good of an education? No, okay. I don't think. I don't think the other um, Boston public schools, uh, in general, would have as as good an education as the three exam schools. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And that's by design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my graduating class went from freshman year something like 320 to senior year 140. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, attrition. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go back to your kindergarten experience. Mm -hmm. um, you lived in Hyde Park and you were bused to Roxbury? Correct. What was that like? Uh, probably a 45 minute bus ride, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, left Hyde Park, went through Mattapan, <clears throat> cut up, uh, if you know Boston, Blue Hill Ave, past the Franklin Park Zoo. And for a few of those years, and I don't know which, but I'm going to say maybe three or four, we were met uh, as Columbia Road comes in from Dorchester at the zoo with police escorts. So it would be a cruiser in the front, and two bikies in the back, as I remember it. Mm -hmm all with lights on, took a left on Seaver Street, and then down toward Humboldt Ave, which is where the school was. And um, they were there to ward off uh, neighborhood kids, I guess. Maybe it was adults, I don't know. But were, that would be either be taunting us or, or throwing rocks and bottles at our bus. Do you remember being afraid? Do you remember anything from that? Concern? I remember my bus monitor, <clears throat> Mrs. Colton, and. Uh, and, and there's a, a thread of history there. If you know the, the restaurant, The Fours, in Boston, no, but you know The Fours, uh, that restaurant is owned by her family. I think it was started by her sons. So, uh, and, uh, and her son was a year ahead of me, one of her sons, um, and on the bus as well. I knew him later on. He lived down in Marshfield, Mass, where I, grew, where I, where I now live, and he lived down there for a few years when I first started, so we kind of had some recollection about being on the bus. Mm. Uh, but uh, she would tell us to duck our heads between our legs. And that's what we had to do for that final lap. It was probably the last mile, I'd say, down Seaver Street to Humboldt Ave. Was that scary? I, I, probably. I, I, don't, I don't hold any of that fear mm. uh, at, at this point. Mm -hmm. I really never had. Uh, it was what I knew. Mm -hmm. It's what we had to do. So there were definitely times when things were thrown at us. And yeah. so I remember windows breaking and that kind of thing. But yeah. it wasn't frequent. Mm -hmm. It happened. Right, right. And um, was there any context around that given to you by your teachers or um, your bus monitor or your parents? Did any, do you remember anyone really talking much? Not particularly, that? no. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that when we got into the school, it didn't matter what color we were. And that was... You know, fantastic, I guess, just as a memory. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no indication of, of race or, or um, negative racism at all. If, uh, if we had issues with kids, it's because we were kids, not because of the color we were. Mm -hmm. You know, some kids were jackasses and some weren't. <laughs> yeah. Truth. Now, did you um, continue to engage with your... Um, school friends after school? I did, actually. It, uh, one of my best friends uh, in school, and I'll say first, second, third grade probably, uh, lived in Roxbury or Dorchester. I forget which, but it was definitely it was a black part of the city, no doubt. And I frequently went over there. He came over to my house uh, after school. we just get on each other's buses. So I'm sure that that was um, designed as such. We would let, you know, the authorities know that he was getting on my bus, I was getting on his bus. And then his mother or grandmother maybe would come over and pick him up if he was over my house in Hyde Park, and my mother would uh, go over and pick me up over his house in that, mm -hmm. that afternoon. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, as I got into the fourth and fifth grade at Trotter, 
it became a little more social. Uh, Trotter was a, a very progressive school. They were set up in pods, and the pods were, um, I don't think there was any vertical direction for a particular type of, of teaching, but in fourth and fifth grade, we were in the same room for both years, and I had the same teacher, and my teacher was Dennis DeCoast, and um, he probably had the most influence on me from a positive perspective during those years, uh, convincing me and some other friends, again, I, a couple Asian guys, a couple white guys, a couple black guys, some girls, some guys. It was just no distinction, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, at, at all about that, but to join the, the chess club. And we took up playing the violin. Uh, some kids were playing the recorder or something. Um, and so that would be kind of the, the extent of the after-school activity. One of, one, of, uh, one of our friends, Jason, um, again, a, a black kid, played hockey. None of the white kids played hockey, so kind of funny when you look at the way you know, it is now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, we would go to his games after, after school sometimes, and uh, Mr. DeCoast would kind of pick us up or have our parents meet us somewhere and, and pick us up, go to the game, and then drop us back to where our par parents would meet us. That was, I guess, kind of the extent of the, of the social outside of school but activity that I had. But would facilitate that, make yeah. that happen, mm -hmm. because your parents really couldn't because you were so far away from home. Right, yeah. 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 That's awesome. I remember we had the best kickball team in the school. <laughs> And that was some that was some high high uh, some high awards right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beating on the get beating a on, participation the, on, the, on the D pod. We were C pod and <laughs> couldn't get past us. Um, what was it like in your neighborhood um, after school or on the weekends? Did you? I had one or two close friends. I uh, didn't have a, a large social group in my neighborhood. Uh, kids from my neighborhood either went to our local elementary school, the Fairmont School, which is now the Boston Police Academy, mm. strangely. Um, and it's where my older siblings went to grammar school, but I never did. I started right up into going to school in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. uh, so they either went to the, the uh, Fairmount or they went to parochial school. Mm -hmm. A few of them went to, went to parochial school. And, uh, but I, I guess there was, as I look back on it, there was some loss there socially because I wasn't in school with kids in my neighborhood. So yeah. I really didn't hang with too many from my neighborhood. Mm. You know, it wasn't until I got into probably middle school into high school that I was hanging more with kids from the hood. Mm -hmm. So when you would go to your friend's house, your black friend's house, what was that like? And what was it like when he came to your house? Over his house, I remember it being more social. I'd get together with his friends and playing stickball or playing, you know, kickball or something like that, you know, for a couple hours after school. Because that was, the school was near his neighborhood. Closer to his neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no question. Um, I mean, I just have in my mind's eye of like going down to a, a, a schoolyard or, or the end of a block, you know, mm -hmm. where, where kids would would get together, or we'd just hang at his house. A lot mm -hmm. of times, I was just one-on-one -on -one friendship too. Yeah, and yeah, his been over, my, over my house. Mm -hmm. There were times I'd go over a friend's house with him. Mm -hmm. um, no issue there. Um, I don't recall too much beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was a good kid, from what I remember. Talk a little bit more about that um, misconnection you had with your community. Did you actually feel a disconnect with your siblings and family also? No. Yeah. No nope. siblings and family, not at all. Yeah, I was a bit younger, though. My oldest brother's nine years older than me, mm -hmm. and then seven, six, three years older. So they were, the age separation kind of dictated our social experience. They were doing very different things than I was at the time. So I, I, I didn't feel any separation from them because of school. You grow up quick, though, when you have older siblings. <laughs> you grow up quick, yeah, absolutely. No doubt you learn that. how to hide things, things from your parents. Yeah. <laughs> and funny. I've got four kids of my own, so you yeah. know, I, I keep an eye out for that. So, um, Can you tell me about a time when you felt unsafe or excluded at school? So I don't recall really exclusion necessarily. Uh, 
I remember a time I had a fight with a kid and I smashed him with my lunchbox. <laughs> that was probably in second or third grade. But the kid was a jerk. Right. And I was a, I was a nice kid. And uh, he just, he, he kept doing it. I remember I got in trouble and I, didn't, I don't think I got suspended. But it was pretty well understood that the kid was a jerk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, but I guess that would be an unsafe feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, there were times when he would kind of corner me and then the next week he'd do the same thing and finally I just said enough of this and I smashed him in the head, but um, he lived as far as I know. Uh, but middle school, we were older and uh, we had more freedom. So uh, if we stayed after school for, let's say a science project, and, and that's kind of what I, what I think that was kind of a recurring thing where, where we would stay after, we would then have to go down to Dudley Station, which was about a, 10 minute walk and these are people kids from your neighborhood no or nope. different neighborhoods uh different neighborhoods throughout yeah. the city i i think i was the only one like if i stayed after with four or five kids we'd all walk down together and i think i was the only one hopping on the orange line at dudley going back to forest hills and then taking forest hills bus to clear square and then walking the mile and a half home or so you know i mean but that's that was fine it's a lot though to uh, stay after school it, it's it's interesting to look at it now because it, you know, with my kids, that just would never happen. I mean, I live in a suburban area, and that's, you know, we we uh, we bring our, our kids up to get used to getting rides everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty much on our own to hop on our bikes to go down to the ballpark. And actually, back to your question, Jared, uh, there, there wa was a, a stretch of years where we didn't hang out right out in the street, but we had a, a ballpark near us, so probably a 10-minute bike ride. And it was either basketball or baseball. So after school, I'd head down there. And from what I remember, it was all white kids. I mean, my neighborhood was all white. But uh, it was just kind of pickup games. It was, it was a lot of great fun. Uh, it, and you'd have to go home when either somebody's mother yelled from over the hill to say, you know, Billy, Sapa, <laughs> or, uh, or those, the, the lights came on. And it's like, all right, let next basket wins, you know, mm -hmm. or, or next, uh, next run wins. But uh, that was certainly, uh, I don't know if like I brought my buddy from school down to that at all. I don't recall that particularly, but that was my experience there. Do you uh, remember the public service announcement? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? You're right, <laughs> right, right. Well, back to the, to the idea of, of, of a, a, an uncomfortable situation for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one time we left the school after after whatever it was that we were doing after school and we were walking on dudley in a large car think like 1972 chrysler newport you know as as big as the city block came driving up with a group of older black teenagers and started throwing bottles at us so we <laughs> took off and um the the slowest elk didn't make it uh, one of the girls was a, a bit behind and a bottle hit the ground, sm smashed up and cut her leg. She fell. They took off. Uh, we retreated, went back and got her. Uh, I remember one of us had like a fall coat on. I remember kind of like wrapping her leg around, you know, thing, like tourniquet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what do you do? Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, we then carried her down to Dudley Station. And um, I don't know the particulars, but in my mind's eye, Everyone was ignoring us, and we mm. were calling for help. Wow. So that was pretty shitty. Uh, and it was adults, it was, and they were all black. Mm -hmm. um, we were calling for help, and people were just kind of turning their heads. And until finally we got down to the, to the pull-out area where the buses turn around before you go into the station and go up to the, to the subway, um, the elevated subway. Um, and uh, a woman came out, black woman. I, again, in my mind's eye, she was maybe four, four and a half feet tall and four and a half feet wide. <laughs> and she came out and she grabbed us and she helped us and she pulled us into her booth and she called 911 and an ambulance came and, and took the girl and we just, we went home. I mean, oh. those kids were gone. There was no, there was no uh, reaction from us to get back at them or anything like that. You know, they were, they were gone and gone. There you go. Mm. So, yeah, bad experience. Yeah. Didn't, didn't hold me down. Mm -hmm. um, I think my that last was the seventies. What was the source of that? And why, why was there violence in the air? And why was there tension between the races? 
we were in their neighborhood. That was it. They, I mean, it was a black neighborhood. Um, and they didn't want whites in their neighborhood. And I'm sure that that was going on in Hyde Park, too. Did you understand that back then? No. I mean, I understood that it was. I don't think I understood why, but I understood that it was, sure. Yeah. I mean, I kind of kept to myself, went, Shh, let's get down there quick. Yeah. Can you talk about the integration? Um, uh, some people yesterday said it was a social experiment. Do you think it was successful? And why or why not? I don't. I don't think it was successful. I think it was a, it was a mandate that uh, either wasn't researched correctly uh, or just was kind of a disastrous failure, frankly. Um, I will say that my school experience was very good, both from an int integration perspective, I'll say, because I was with blacks and Asians and Hispanics, and it just didn't matter. We really didn't care too much mm. about, again, as I said earlier, about what your race was or ethnicity or sex or just, we were just kind of there. Was it kind of like let the kids be kids and parents stay out of it? It could have been successful. Could have been that way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the education was successful. So to answer your question about my being there at the school, I think that was successful. I think the forced integration part of it was was very much not so. Because it just, it, I, I know in from learning about it in later years, it caused a lot of a lot of problems in the neighborhoods with... Do you think, though, you would have had the opportunity to mix with all the different races had it not happened there? I think in high school I would have, because if... Or, or actually, maybe even in middle school, because I don't know how Boston public schools were set up uh, in that it could have been that you'd kind of go to your local town or local neighborhood. Middle school also, I don't know that. Uh, but high school, would, and I was never going to go to Hyde Park High. Hyde Park High is a pretty shitty school and was back in the 70s, 80s. And, um, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? We heard some people talk about it yesterday. It sounded like there was a lot of violence there. A lot of violence at Hyde Park High. A lot of violence at South Boston High, Dorchester High. Um, many of the, and I'm using the word neighborhood, Boston, we call them neighborhoods, so South Boston is a neighborhood. But, of course, within that neighborhood, there are neighborhoods, which is your street, your block, you know. Um, so uh, Hyde Park High had a great history of, uh, of violence and turmoil. Possibly caused from busing, don't know. I know that kids that I knew from Hyde Park that went to Hyde Park High didn't get a great education. A lot of it was just kind of watching your back. And uh, they had metal detectors, and that was, that was something back in the 80s. We didn't have that at Boston Latin Academy. Um, and they were just kind of doing it to get through. I've, I've got friends that went to English High. English High used to be a great high school back in probably the 50s and 60s. But it was a pretty horrendous school right across from Boston Latin. Mm. And, and uh, I've heard stories about there were floors you didn't go on if you were white. There were s floors you didn't go on if you were black. And they were completely unattended by security. So, it, you know, you were at your own risk and peril to go into parts of those buildings. I mean, that's... How do you get an education not a good, like yeah, that? How do you get an education yeah. doing that? Yeah. Right. My high school was not like that at all. Was My high, high school, school was mostly white? No. No. Mm -hmm. It was probably a, a even mix of all races. I mean, there were a lot of Asian, black, white, Hispanic. No security guards, no, no metal detectors. No. And it's kind of understood. It's an exam school, so that alone sets it aside, that you're there by want mm -hmm. and by earning the, the position, earning the seat. And that's why so many had left through my three years going into senior year because they just weren't cutting it, mm -hmm. you know, or they didn't want to do the work, yeah. you know. As a teenager, like what I had... Going, in, going towards high school, choosing to want to go to the exam route versus... In my family, it was kind of understood that's the way you were going to go. It really wasn't an option, and I, I didn't fight it. It seemed 
seemed like a, a viable path to me, and, and that's what I knew. And that's what um, your siblings did. And that's what my siblings did, right? So I was kind of following in their Were footsteps. Were you nervous but that you weren't going to get in? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I remember when I was accept So at Latin, you can get in in sixth grade, or it's sixth into seventh, I guess. So it's seventh grade and ninth grade. And there's a stigma for being in ninth grade, you're called a BZ. Mm -hmm. In seventh grade, you're an AZ. And the AZs had it all over the BZs because they got in in seventh grade. Oh. Right? <laughs> so there was definitely some of that, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what the Dr. Seuss uh, book is yeah, of, right. the, of the, the haves and the have-nots yes, or whatever, you know. the star bellies. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And uh, so th there, was, there was definitely some uh, catch-up, I guess, socially that I, I needed to do right away. And I did. I, I jumped in. Actually, a lot of my friends that I ended up with were AZs as opposed to BZs, but that's just by, by the way that that happened. But to your question about, um, about either concern about not getting in, sure, no doubt, if I didn't get in, I, didn't, I don't know what I was going to do. I guess I was going to go to Copley High, mm -hmm. right? Which would have been fine too, I guess. I had friends going there, so I would have known kids. But interesting, because at the time it was Boston Latin, Boston Latin Academy and Boston Tech in that sequence of um, highest to lowest. Mm -hmm. And my oldest brother got into, t got into tech, which was the lowest of the three. Then I had three siblings that got into Latin, which was the highest, and I got into Latin Academy. Mm -hmm. So when I learned about it, I got the letter uh, on a Friday afternoon. I hopped on, a Peter pa I hopped on, the, on the bus train, Peter Pan bus going up to visit my, my uh, cousins up in New Hampshire. And when I got up there that night, of course, there's no cell phones. This was back in 79, going into 1980. And I called home and said, hey, I got the letter. And, uh, and when I said, now this is, I remember this clear as day, but when I said that I, it, was, it was Boston Latin Academy, my mother was disappointed mm -hmm. that I didn't get into Latin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I, I said, you know, I, I, I called her on it. And then after the weekend, I went back home. And on Monday, uh, I remember having a conversation with my father and her saying, you know, you, you kind of responded disappointed. She said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. She tried to, tried to cover it over. And I said, nah, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely responded at, that you were dis disappointed <laughs> that I didn't get into Latin. So there were some other things going on there, too, with, uh, with the way that <clears throat> the grading happened. As I understand it, I don't come to this with facts, but as was the Boston Civil Service, it's civil service exam, there were, um, it was kind of set up to accept minorities pr before white. Um, and so I was told that uh, minorities could get in with a lower score than whites. Mm -hmm. And I think that was going on with Boston Police, uh, Boston Fire, and some of the EMT groups that were run by the city as well. And it was for integration, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing that, that that may have played into my getting into Latin Academy, but I had a very good experience at Latin Academy. Yeah. My, my best friends in school were uh, South Boston, Dorchester, East Boston, Rosendale, West Roxbury, just, you know, again, it was a situation where not from my neighborhood necessarily. Yeah. That heads up, we have about 10 minutes for okay. recording time, and I'll give you a two-minute warning once we're wrapping up. Um, so that in that vein, um, do you feel like you were set up to be able to fully experience and embrace people from around the city? Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. Um, again, color wasn't a thing yeah. in high school. Mm -hmm. It was, you were there to succeed. And we helped each other out. Um, some of my best friends in high school and in college were black guys. And mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. It was, it was more because of music. Because mm -hmm. I listened to Earth, Wind & Fire and Cool & The Gang and The Gap Band. And, you know, I wasn't listening to, to rock at the time. And uh, so that was, uh, I had good connection. One of my best friends in college, I went to University of Mass at Amherst, was a black kid from St. Louis, grew up in the city. And we spent hours together swapping cassette tapes, taping yeah. from each other, you know, <laughs> just great music. I think 8 and 10, I think I read that correctly, 8 and 10 Bostonians think race is still an issue in the city in 2023. Is there a remedy for it? Like, how, how do we fix that? 
Ah, wow. Um, I think it probably is. I think, I think a lot of it is systemic. It's just because if you've got parents and grandparents that grew up in the city and had that outlook, that can t tend to lead down to the next generation. Um, how do you fix it? I would say, as, and I'll take my role as a parent, I teach my kids to judge people, uh, or not to judge people, but to accept people for who they are and make your own um, judgment, if you will, on people based on their moral character, not on their sex or their race. It should never work into it. My kids have all gone to Marshfield schools. Marshfield is a predominantly white um, town. Uh, they've had some black kids in school. Racism never really came up with them. If I brought my kids up in Hyde Park or Dorchester right now, I'll bet racism would be a part of that existence. Oh, sure, yeah. I, I believe in smaller government. So I think the government is way too big and way too involved in, in the way that we uh, live our lives, the way that me, I, as a parent, should raise my kids. I think that there's a, a great bit of uh, indoctrination going on in schools. They're teaching my kids that I, that things that I think are, are, are not correct, but it's just driven by the system. So. Uh, I think I think that the that the system is a big part of of that problem, that they're just too involved in in trying to get people to think a certain way or to force them to act in a in a certain way. Just let people be people. Yeah. A lot of people would make the argument that interventions sometimes are necessary. Do you think any interventions would help some of this process? On the political side. I don't, I don't think intervention, because uh, that's mandated. Intervention is kind of a forced effort, and I, I just don't see success in that. I think people will shy away if they feel as though they're being forced into something. Um, maybe through some kind of a social offering to get people together, you know, have, have some kind of a, a community program where invite everyone. That's not, if, if that's intervening, then yes, I, I would say that that would be successful. But I, I think of inter intervention as more of a, of a forced mandate. So going back to Peterson, do you wish they had done that instead? Had they come to communities and tried to, tried to find a solution that would work for everybody? I don't know. Um, I was too young. So, and as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't anything that I was transitioning from. It was what I grew right into. Uh, I got a great education at the Trotter and at the Wheatley, and I had some very good friends there, and it didn't matter what race we were. Um, it was a pretty horrible time in Boston, no doubt. There was a group that I think started in South Boston that would make its way down through Hyde Park, and we had caravans going up and down our streets. So incidentally, I'll, I'll throw this out there too, I, I hadn't mentioned this, I had a foster sister who was black. So in my neighborhood, having a foster sister that was black was not, um, not terribly accepted, not highly accepted. But we had, we had caravans of cars going up and down our street, um, calling us nigger lovers and saying get out and and spray painting or chalking our our driveway with, you know, defamation and yeah, pretty shitty. People people can be rotten. I, I remember seeing it from my window, uh, but I don't remember having any feelings about it. I just remember you know, my brother saying, get away from the window, because they could be throwing stuff at us. Chris, I heard you kind of connect this, like the values you hold today, mm -hmm. and this idea that the system or systemically driven things uh, don't work. Do you think that's informed by what you experienced when you were young, kind of like this forced integration that you mentioned? I think that may have a part of it. Uh, I think it also just may be that as I grew older, I learned that in order to succeed, 
you have to put effort in and you have to do for yourself. And that's what I tell my kids. You know, don't, don't look for handouts. Don't, uh, don't expect government assistance. It's great if you need it, and I'm a big, I'm a big uh, proponent of that. If somebody needs something, I'm all in. But uh, I will, I'm, a, I'm a great opponent of people who just take advantage of the system. And I think what happens if, is if there is an intervention or if there is some kind of a forced mandate, that people will find a way to take advantage of that, especially with money involved. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things do kind of translate to money. Are you optimistic about the future of Boston? Or are there lessons that we can learn from the last 50 years and apply those going forward? I am. I think this next generation um, doesn't have that, that inherent sense of them versus us um, in Boston. I've got some friends that live in Boston, and I've got black friends that live in South Boston. Who'd have thunk that? Right. Right? I mean, that's phenomenal. I've got white friends that are living in the South End, which back in the day was a pretty rough area. So I think that uh, Boston itself, the city, uh, from an adult perspective, is a, is a good place to be. I don't know enough about the, the school part of it. I think that inner city schools are tough, wherever you are whether you're in New York City or, or Boston. I think inner city is tough to, tough to get through school. Yeah. And you have to know that, you're, that you are making an effort to get a good, good education and don't just get pushed through like cattle. Uh, not necessarily. I think I've, I've talked a bit. Uh, I've explained uh, a, a lot of it having to do with my parents' desire to, uh, to push towards the affirmative action that was going on in the 70s. Um, I think some of it was, um, couldn't have been achieved just by nature of who we are. At the time, you have to make choices to get along with people. And I think a lot of people chose not to get along with, with uh, other people based on race or yeah. neighborhood. Or I mean, sometimes competition is good as long as it's healthy. So this last question I have is a staple sort of core question. So if you were to look at your life and the legacy of your family, how would your parents think about who you've grown up to be? They, they, my father is still alive. My mother is not. And they together would be very proud of me. You know, they, they've seen me grow into a man who has worked hard and has good, solid, core, moral ethics. And no bullshit. <laughs> I mean, That's I would... I, part, right. I mean, I would have to kind of pull them around and say, all right, cut through this BS that you're, t you're talking about. Let's talk about the, the core you know, fact at hand here. And they'd laugh and they'd say, yeah, we, we know that that's your preference. And, and those are the values you're carrying to the next generation, your kids. Absolutely, yeah. And my kids, I've got one through college, two in college, one in high school. And uh, they know how I feel about things. I, I, don't, I don't hide it. College wasn't an option. I mean, was not, it not, not an option? Not going to college yeah. is not an option right. in my family. I do carry that legacy from, sure. from Marianne and Dan, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my father is in Duxbury now. He was in town, and he's now at an assisted living in, in Boston. And my mother, sadly, 11 years ago, fell uh, down a set of stairs and hit her head with major brain damage. Mm -hmm. And she lived for 10 years in Brighton, ironically, at the Brighton House, which is a nursing home uh, here in Brighton. And her body was strong, but she couldn't talk or walk. Wow. And she did finally pass away right before COVID, December 2019. Sorry. So well, thank you, but yeah, it was yeah. it was a good passing because quality as as clean as the place was, it was quality of life was horrible, and to have that as your golden years was just. Are your kids still close? Are they very close? Are they uh, close? Oh, uh, proximity wise, uh, yeah. I've one just moved back from Arizona, went to Arizona State. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a, a a senior, not too close, East Carolina University down in Greenville, North Carolina, uh, a freshman at University of New Hampshire. And my youngest is 
sophomore at Marshfield High. Yeah, uh, New Hampshire's not very far away at all. That's right. Still good there, yeah. That's right. We went by there. We picked her up yesterday morning, oh, cool. as a matter of nice. fact. Finished up her senior year in, uh, in civil engineering. So yeah, civil engineering also. there you go. That's a great field. Yeah, I, I did not go that direction. Obviously. I say that she <laughs> gets her brands from her mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just smart lady. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 